Okay, in this video, we're going to uh, just give a big picture overview of the law and order problems uh, in the West. I'm just going to introduce uh, this aspect of the course, uh, and then the subsequent videos will focus on the uh, various problems with law and order that took place during this time period. Uh, the American West is often associated with lawlessness and violence. Uh, if you ask your parents or grandparents, uh, many of them will have watched you know, Western movies as, as kids. Um, and these movies often tended to highlight gunfights and saloon brawls as being a key part of living out in the West. Now, in some respects, that level of violence was overstated and over glamorized obviously to get punters through the door of the cinemas in the uh, when those films were particularly popular but there's no place no doubt sorry that the west was a tough place uh, to make a living in this section there are a number of recurring themes that we'll encounter the first is that the US federal government was either unable or unwilling to effectively enforce the law in the West. And this created a whole host of problems um, that, that creates the conditions for violence and lawlessness. It meant that local civilians often had to take matters into their own hands and they do this by forming, uh, for example, vigilante groups to, in a sense, police themselves uh, but those groups could often be prone to excessive violence and uh, treating uh, suspects you know, illegally and unfairly. We see uh, that wealthy businessmen often use their power and their connections to intimidate rivals. We see this, for example, in the Johnson County War, where the wealthy cattle ranchers try to use their political connections their wealth, their ability to raise an army, essentially, to try to tackle the, what they perceive as the threat from smaller ranches and homesteaders in Johnson County, Wyoming. And we also see poorer groups, uh, groups like the homesteaders, like sheep herders, for example, uh, fighting back against this. And uh, some historians have suggested that the violence uh, in the West uh, particularly in the later period, uh, can be seen as an example of class war, as uh, the sort of middle class, sort of slightly poorer elements, um, the small farmers, the homesteaders, those individual uh, sort of disparate groups fight against the incredibly powerful and wealthy, uh, you know, big businessmen that often control not just the land, but the politics of the area. Many of them have connections indeed with the uh, highest positions in the entire country. So it's important as well, just before we get started, uh, to make the distinction between states and territories and to try to understand how the territories uh, were governed in the West and, and how this worked because this is actually the source of some of the problems. If you look at the map, it shows you uh, the political organisation of the United States in, the 18, in 1860, so just before the start of the Civil War. Now, if we look at the uh, West, we can see uh, we've got uh, two uh, states there, California and Oregon in the pink, and then a large number of territories in the gold colour. And there's an important distinction between a state and a territory. Um, and this is really important. Uh, the territories were basically, uh, although they look very large in terms of their geographic size, they're territories because they simply don't have enough people in them yet. Uh, they don't meet the population threshold for statehood. California met that very quickly because of the, the gold rush uh, brought so many people in so quickly. Uh, but places like Kansas and Nebraska, it took a long time for them to uh, gain the requisite number of people to be able to become states. Uh, so until that happened, these territories were largely administered by the federal government based in Washington, D.C. Now, I'll just use my mouse cursor. 
the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C. is sort of over here. OK, so right on the east coast of the United States. Uh, and the officials uh, based in Washington, D.C. Uh, would make the laws for the territories. They'd appoint the governor. They'd provide law enforcement officials, often not very many of them and often not very well paid. But they would provide that for the territory. But as you can see, Washington, D.C. is a long way away from places like Kansas or Utah or California or wherever it might be out in the West. And of course, before the railroad comes, we know how difficult it is to get to these places in the first place. So what we have is the population increasing more quickly than the uh, legal system can keep up with in, in these areas. And, and the states in the pink, they could enforce the law much more effectively because basically they had the power within the US Constitution to organise that for themselves. The people in the different states would elect their own governor. Uh, they'd elect state politicians. They'd elect sometimes some of the law enforcement officials, heads of the police and sheriffs and so on, would be elected by the population of these states. Bear in mind that this is 1860, so large numbers of citizens, particularly in the southern states, of course, were disenfranchised due to their race, for example, or due to the fact that slavery was, uh, was in existence. But, but you get the idea. But law enforcement there tended to be more effective because they didn't need the help of the governments in Washington, D.C. They have their own governments in their own states. In the territories, which are these large, largely, uh, you know, very underpopulated areas um, with, you know, a few white settler colonists, obviously Native Americans who sort of had a very ambiguous status as far as the U.S. government was concerned. Um, it was much more difficult to keep control. So... Uh, that just kind of frames this topic. Uh, we're going to start by looking at how law and order uh, problems were created as a result of the gold rush of 1849. That will be the topic of video two.